Don't Depend on Daddy is an unfiltered safe space, empowering young professionals to build independence in their 20s and beyond, whether it be personal, professional, or financial. Regardless of your age, relationship status, or job title, the most consistent person in your life is you. So join me and let's build our independence together. Enjoy. Hello, and welcome back to Don't Depend on Daddy, the podcast. My name is Michaela. I am your host, and I'm super excited because today we have a guest on the show, Courtney Johnson. I'll get into that in a moment, but I'm going to run through our housekeeping super quick. So first things first, as always, if you don't have the personal finance dashboard, you should totally get it. The personal finance dashboard is my signature financial planning tool. You can get $10 off using the code podcast one. And second, if you have not ordered my book, Own Your Career, my latest book that came out this past July, or my first book, Own Your Money, you totally should. I have copies of both of them right here. These make an amazing gift for anyone in your life who is trying to get their financial act together. If they're trying to overhaul and recalibrate their career, they can definitely benefit from either of these books. And of course, you can get them on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, anywhere you purchase books. They're also available via audiobook and on Kindle with an ebook. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way... I'll give you a quick little background on Courtney and what we're going to be talking about, and then I'll pivot right over to the episode. So Courtney Johnson is a personal branding expert and content creator based in Austin, Texas. She shares tons of tips and advice about like growing on LinkedIn, building out a personal brand, how to stand out on social, how to like navigate your career and really stand out at work. And honestly, so much more than that. She's great on LinkedIn and TikTok. I think those are her two main platforms. I've been following her for quite some time. In the episode, we discuss personal branding, social media, being seen, and the fear of being seen, how to get started building a personal brand, and so much more. What I do want to emphasize is a personal brand, and we talk about this a little bit, a personal brand doesn't have to be public or external facing, which I think is what a lot of people think it is. Like you have to be growing an audience on social media. Your personal brand is really who you are as a person, right? It's how you show up in your life. It's how you show up at work. It's how you're perceived. And you actually have a lot of control over building out your personal brand in your own real life, not on the internet, through your actions, both at work and in your life. So this is a really interesting conversation. I'm super excited to get into it. Courtney is one of my favorite creators. I took her LinkedIn cohort back in June. It was fantastic. So definitely something to consider if you're looking to get started on LinkedIn and really learn how to leverage it as a tool. And with that, let's get into the episode. Hi, Courtney. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Could you kick us off by sharing a little bit about you, how you got started on social media and maybe like your career background? Yeah. So my career has always been in marketing uh, and sales, mainly for a lot of tech startups. And I got into social media because I was creating social media strategies for my clients And in these strategies, I would have like 90% of the budget and the resources put towards the brand social media and brand marketing. So like the brand email campaigns, the brand blog, the brand Instagram page, and then 10% of the strategy would go to a personal brand. So maybe that's the founder, maybe that's the CEO, maybe that's a person on the sales team. And every single time, like this is out of 50 plus clients I had worked with every single time without a single exception, the 10% of effort and budget put into personal brand would supersede the results of the 90% of effort put into the company brand. So I realized that there was a pattern. So I went off on my own and started just ghostwriting and managing personal brands freelance. And then I was doing it for so many other people and making other people money. And I was like, all right, I got to do this for myself now. (laughs) Yeah, I totally, totally, totally feel you on that because I mean, when I started Break Your Budget, it wasn't with the guise of like starting my own personal brand. I feel like I learned about personal branding after the fact, but it was when I realized that sharing more about who you are and your journey is actually what makes the biggest difference in monetizing and like building trust and everything that everything in my business started to change. So I'm curious when it comes to personal branding, because this is a question that I get all the time. I'd imagine you get it all the time too. Is having a personal brand 
necessary? Is it something that everyone should have? And is it only for people who want to work freelance? Okay, great question. I don't think that everybody is called to create a personal brand. I don't think everyone is interested in it. And I don't think everybody needs it. But if you have certain goals, you definitely need it. For example, I work with a lot of VCs that will straight up turn you away if you don't have somewhat of a following, if you don't have somewhat of a credibility online, if you don't have somewhat of an audience that's already excited to buy your thing. And I'm not saying that you can never get fundraising if you don't have a personal brand, but it's going to be a lot harder for you. It's going to be a lot harder for you to get freelance clients. It's going to be a lot harder for you to get a speaking career. Now, again, not everybody wants that, but if you do want um, some of these public facing goals in your career, yes, it is pretty necessary. And is it just for those who want to work freelance? Absolutely not. Definitely not. It is for those, really anybody that has big goals because personal branding is really just a reflection of like public perceptions of unconscious biases. And I mean biases in a neutral way, not necessarily negative biases, but let's say that your goal is to be a CFO one day and you want to be in C-suite and right now you're just an analyst. A lot of that is going to be the perception and biases that people have towards you. So maybe you want to start to curate biases around you being a leader. So maybe you want to start hosting webinars for your company and putting those on LinkedIn. Maybe you want to start stepping out a little bit more publicly. Maybe you want to, you know, fundraise one day. That's a great way. Like it's great to start your personal brand, but definitely not just for those who work freelance. Although having a personal brand as a freelancer is definitely going to help you get clients. That's a really interesting way to describe it because I feel like the natural association that people have for building a personal brand is becoming an influencer or a content creator when really what building a personal brand is just is is sharing your perspective in a public forum. Um, so I'm curious from your perspective, if you had to describe like what a personal brand is to a fifth grader, how would you describe it? I would tell them it's how, yeah, I would tell a fifth grader that personal brand is how your friends see you, how your teachers see you, how other parents see you and how they talk about you. And you could actually change that. So if your teachers see you as a kid that doesn't really work hard, you can do actions that will make them perceive you as someone that does work hard. If you're seen as a cool kid, you can do actions that will make you not a cool kid. You can transform how other people see you based on your actions. So yes, this can mean publicly, but it can also mean in a smaller setting. For example, you don't have to post anything publicly to have a personal brand. Maybe you're just focused on building your personal brand internally at your organization. That could be how your calendar is set up and your boundaries around your calendar. That could be your Slack profile picture. That could be your email signature. That could be how you talk about your work. That could be the way you speak to others. All of these little things inform our personal brand. So it really creates a feedback loop where um, you're improving yourself. Uh, based on your goals, other people are seeing that and reflecting back to you and it creates a feedback loop. Okay. That's another really interesting perspective because I was going to ask you how having a personal brand fits into your broader career, whether you want to work a corporate career or go freelance, because I feel like people online viewers specifically in creators are very split around like I'm going down the corporate or I'm going down the freelance. I do think even though we see a lot of people who have a corporate job and have a side hustle, that is the minority of people. It's the people who are showing up online. So if someone was thinking about building a personal brand publicly, let's say they want to grow an audience online, but they don't necessarily want to be perceived as an influencer, what kinds of tips would you have for someone who wants to get started? And where on social media would you tell them to start? Well, the first thing that I would say is the fear of not wanting to be an influencer. I would tell them you got to get over it because everyone is an influencer. Your grandmother is an influencer because she 
texts her friends on WhatsApp and sends them pictures of her shoes or the things she saw at Marshall's. Like you're every single person on this earth is an influencer. So get over it. Um, first tip, po- pick one platform, any platform, post one time per week for one year. And, wa- and, and that's going to give you an amazing, amazing, amazing setup. It's, ex- it's extremely minimal. It's still going to get your results and it's going to get you in the habit and get you comfortable posting. So start there. It is like even one time per week on one platform for one year can really bring you a lot of opportunities. So that's the first tip. One platform once a week for one year. Second tip is be authentic to you. Do not put yourself through a filter of how you think you should show up. For example, let's say you're a graphic design freelancer, but you also are really interested in, I don't know, a a certain cause. You're really interested in supporting local farmers. And then you also love CrossFit and you also love your dogs, but you're like, oh no, no, no. I should only talk about graphic design. I can't talk about all these other things because I'm going to confuse my audience. No, talk about everything. Share everything you're interested in because you might find little niches that you didn't even know exist. Maybe there's a dog toy company that specifically wants to work with you because you're a graphic designer and they've seen your content around how you love your dog. Like, so maybe you also speak Spanish and you post posts in Spanish. Well, maybe there is a project for you that you have to be bilingual for. Like there's all this magic that happens when you share who you truly are. So the second tip is don't try to filter yourself and don't try to stick to only one topic if you have other passions, post about everything. Um, And the third tip is it's a skill. Like don't uh, assume that your posts are immediately going to get like millions of views. It's the same thing as learning an instrument. Like you're going to have to learn a broad set of skills. You have to learn how to read sheet music. You have to learn how to move your hands. You have to learn how to understand the lingo. It's the same as creating content. It's not just one skill. It's kind of a whole library of skills that you have to learn and that you're going to continuously iterate upon. So have patience with yourself. Um, yeah, th- those are, those would be my top three tips. So many amazing things that I want to elaborate on with that first being that it's a skill that you actually have to learn to do. I think, and I'm sure you feel this way too, content creation is one of the most under-respected skills that exists in the work place, job market, whatever. I feel like so many people think that being an influencer or being a content creator, posting videos on TikTok is the easiest, simplest job in the world. It's so funny because I saw a creator this morning, um, Wishbone Kitchen. I don't know if you follow her. I'm sure people listening to this do. She recently, she just bought a house on the Hamptons. And all of the comments, I'd say half of them were positive and the other half of them were like, is everybody just a rich influencer now? And what I found so interesting about that angle is that I think people really do sincerely think that creating content and building a platform and a personal brand and monetizing it to this level, the level to buy a house is like a really easy thing to do when it's actually such a difficult skill to get to that scale. And it does take a lot of time, like years and years of building up how to do it how to perfect it or perfect it in your own tone, how to find your people, how to integrate everything, kind of that second point about sharing all of your different interests. And so I'm curious if you agree, disagree on content creation being an under-respected skill. It it absolutely is an under-respected skill. I think that's because it's, uh, I don't know, a lot of skills and jobs that are mostly females tend to be under-respected. So there's that gender play there that could definitely play into it. It is so hard because you're not just creating content. Like people think, oh, you post and then you get paid money. Like it's not that simple. There's the entire operations aspect to your business. There's a financial aspect to your business. Then there's, if you actually want to monetize it, either working with brands or creating your own offerings and your own product, then boom, like you're a product business or you're a media company. Um, It's definitely, definitely under-respected. It is such a valuable skill though, because you have leverage. The leverage, like I could sell one ad deal with a client for like a few thousand dollars. Now, if I had double my audience, instead of $4,000, I can sell it for $8,000 with no extra work. So I think that's where people start to get upset about it is because of the concept of leverage. 
However, there are so many different types of leverage and people don't shit on the concept of leverage when it comes to like investing. <laughs> so why do they shit on the concept of leverage when it comes to like audience? Yeah, no, that's a very interesting way to put it because I completely agree. And I don't know if I'm just like more tuned into the negativity online than I am with the positivity, uh, but I have been noticing that tone, especially with creators who have been in the game for a while and probably got in at just the right time. I think a lot of us who have been online and have become successful now, like everyone started three years ago before people realized what it was going to turn into. Um, but all that to say, it's an under-respected skill. I want to go back to that second point that you made a few minutes ago about only focusing on sharing one thing and how that actually is not the right strategy to take because that resonates with me a lot when I started my own Break Your Budget and how I was so siloed. I only ever wanted to post personal finance content and I dabbled in career. I still dabble in career content. And it wasn't really until the beginning of this year, end of last year, beginning of this year that I started sharing more personal lifestyle content. And the amount of business that I've gotten from niche not niche companies, but like niche compared to me, like skincare brands or homeware brands and things like that is mind blowing to me. Um, and so for someone who let's say is in that mindset of like, well, I want to have this very professional forward facing image. Do you have tips for how you can share more of the like niche kind of stuff or lifestyle ask personal interests, we'll call them. Um, content online without bearing too much? Because that's another line that I think gets really confusing is everybody feels like they have to go all or nothing. Like I either have to be a full lifestyle creator or I have to be a full professional skill-based content creator or whatever, if we're going to make the division. How do you navigate that gray? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you brought this up because it definitely is important to have boundaries. I definitely don't think you, unless you want to, you don't need to post about every aspect of your life. For example, I love to travel. I travel all the time. I rarely ever post about travel because I don't want that to turn into work. Um, but it is important to post a little bit more than one topic because if you only post one topic, you have no differentiator. You are in um, a sea of other marketing creators or finance creators. Like there is no different differentiation if you're only talking about one topic. But once you become the finance creator who also has this really inspiring story throughout their career journey, who also likes home and lifestyle stuff, who also loves their cat or their dog and loves to travel, then you become much more of a, a niche of, of one, right? Um, for example, I have uh, a client that is a marketing creator who is also really into gaming, and she was hesitant to talk about gaming at first. But once she talked about gaming, you know, she was talking about marketing. There's so many marketing creators, and she was just saying the same thing as everyone else. But when she started talking about gaming and bringing in her other passion, she became the only gaming marketing creator. She became a category of one. So all of the gaming companies that wanted marketing consulting went straight to her. All of the um, gaming companies that wanted influencer marketing went straight to her. Like she became the only person. So when you put like two or three different categories together, you can become a category of one rather than trying to like be the top 1% at something where it's so saturated. I also think it makes, it just makes the whole process a little bit more interesting and fun. I feel like at the beginning of this year was when I was like, okay, oh my gosh, I can't talk about budgeting every day in my life anymore. Like it becomes so boring and dry and adding in those other pillars or like areas of interest for me made making content much more enjoyable. And I think when it comes to that personal branding, uh, consistency is a huge layer to it. Um, and if you don't actually enjoy doing it, or if you've, you know, proverbially run out of topics to talk about, you stop doing it. It becomes boring and it becomes hard. So I think the personal aspect is so, so important. And I find, interestingly enough, the more I share my own perspectives and lessons on things, but also about my life, like my personal posts always tend to perform the best across platforms, which I find really interesting. Um, but I want to pivot a little bit to like social strategy specifically. 
I know you're very passionate about LinkedIn, but I also know you're very passionate about all social media. And so I want to ask, fuck, Mary, kill LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram. <laughs> where do you fall on the spectrum? I love this question. Um, I'd probably marry LinkedIn because LinkedIn is consistent. It's made me so much money. It's got me every job. Like it's, it's always there. Um, and it's not going anywhere. It's owned by Microsoft. Like it's solid. I would, ugh, I hate to say this, but I would kill TikTok because it's too volatile. I don't know if it's going away. I don't know if it's sticking around. It's, it is volatile. I don't know if TikTok will st stick around forever. And I would probably fuck Instagram because Instagram is pretty solid. Um, I, although I have a much bigger audience on TikTok, I do have better revenue from Instagram because the audience is just a little bit older. It's like more millennial. TikTok is more Gen Z. So yeah, marry LinkedIn, kill TikTok, fuck Instagram. What, what would yours be? I would also kill TikTok. I'm having an issue on TikTok just because like, I feel like I can't find my, I go through phases where I'm finding my people. I'm not finding my people. My videos are performing. They're not performing. It's like a five to six month cycle where I'm on and then I'm off. I'm on and then I'm off. Very stressful. So like, I prefer to not. I also feel similarly to you. I don't get as much business specifically from TikTok. I do find though that a lot of my brand partnerships are on TikTok, which I think maybe because they have better like ads and like spark ads and all that kind of stuff, brands prefer to be there. I'm not sure about that. That could be an interesting area to, to dig into. I think I would fuck LinkedIn just because I'm still trying to figure LinkedIn out. Um, and marry Instagram because I would say the majority of my business comes from Instagram, at least on my own paid products, um, which is so mm -hmm. interesting because I feel like TikTok gets the most attention, but it's actually Instagram and LinkedIn that are the best for revenue generation. And so I'm curious because you mentioned that LinkedIn is sort of like your where you're getting the most of your business. How specifically are you leveraging LinkedIn in order to do that? Because obviously posting, you know, you're, you're generating attention and whatnot, but are you talking to people in the DMs? Are you cold messaging mm -hmm. people? Are they messaging you? Like how tactically is that working? Yeah, all of it happens. I cold message people, people cold message me. Um, I talk about specific offerings. What's really great about LinkedIn is it has the corporate money. So yes, I can go on Instagram and sell my courses or consulting or whatever, but there's going to be, um, you know, there's a, there's a budget. It's individuals that are going to buy it on LinkedIn, cor like corporations buy it. Corporations will buy some seats in my course for their team. Corporations will buy, um, consulting with me. And that is just so much of a bigger budget. Yeah, actually, I really never thought about that at all. Um, and that's definitely going to change. I feel like the way I look at and think about LinkedIn. Um, so when it comes to like optimizing a LinkedIn page, let's say someone just has their, you know, run of the mill corporate LinkedIn with their jobs on it, whatever. They've never really posted anything on there. Obviously we're getting past the barrier of feeling like self-conscious about posting on LinkedIn. Do you have any tips for someone to figure out like, what should that first post be because the first post is the hardest I feel like to like <laughs> break the ice yeah it is hard I recommend easing into it to start to get comfortable so maybe you're first starting by just resharing other people's posts and boosting them and then you're going to start to create your own posts but you're going to talk about other people you're going to talk about this course that you took and how you really valued the professor's advice you're going to talk about the podcast episode you listened to and you're going to talk about how you really liked it. You're going to talk about the YouTube channel that you're learning how to code on. Um, you're going to shout out one of your employees. So you're going to talk about other people and you're going to take the focus off of you. And then the third step, I would recommend curating content. So curating maybe words from a book or curating a framework that you follow or curating a list of your favorite tools that you use. And then you're going to feel really comfortable. And then I would recommend starting to create your own content. And honestly, if you have content on other platforms, just post that on LinkedIn. A lot of people think like, oh, I have to be like extra strategic or whatever on LinkedIn. You really don't. I, you can post the exact same thing um, and it's going to perform well. 
Yeah, I've been trying that. Um, and I do find that it does, it takes the pressure off. Um, mm-hmm. My LinkedIn is still, you know, infantile. We're working on it. But I do think that if you have posts in other places, it does make getting onto LinkedIn a lot easier. I've found, at least from my perspective, it's such a weird experience having a platform on social media that is historically known to be like hard to grow on, like an Instagram, for example, and then going to LinkedIn and basically starting from zero where it's like, oh, like I actually have to do this again. Um, And it does take a little bit of time of throwing spaghetti at the wall really to see what clicks. And I think that's a part of the process of building up any type of brand, personal or not, that a lot of us miss is how difficult it is to find not only like your audience, but the style of content and the cadence of content that works for you and like what you can stick with. Um, Mm -hmm. I have a question for you around Instagram versus LinkedIn. This is a question from um, someone who follows me on Instagram and they asked, Instagram feels more like a resume than LinkedIn. I'm going to assume this is coming from like a more corporate perspective. Do you think that people should be focused on creating like a more public image on Instagram? Or do you think that LinkedIn is a better bang for your buck or bang for your time? I think it depends on what industry you're in. Um, If you're in a like much more creative industry, maybe like fashion or design or something like that. Yeah. Instagram is going to be great for a portfolio, but anything else, any industry that's a little bit more traditional, um, definitely, definitely LinkedIn. But honestly, realistically, the person that's hiring you is probably looking at all of your social media. They're probably looking at your Instagram. They're probably looking at your LinkedIn. They're definitely looking at your LinkedIn. You also have to think about like when they're hiring, what path are they going through? So that person that's hiring you, they're going to have to send your LinkedIn URL to their boss. They're going to have to prove that you're the best person for the job. And if you're making their job really, really easy by having all of your work out there on social media, it's going to make their job and convincing their boss a lot easier. Okay. Interesting perspective. Another question for you regarding LinkedIn is like, okay, let's imagine someone's building their personal brand and they want to monetize. What ways can you use LinkedIn to monetize? Because I feel like when we're thinking traditionally about social media, the first thing that comes to mind is like a sponsored post. Obviously, brands do sponsor content on LinkedIn. I think that's newer. But what other ways can you bring in revenue? Yeah. So one way I love is just adding a paid calendar scheduling link to your LinkedIn. This is going to immediately signal to people that you value your time. And it's also going to give an opportunity for all of those like pick your brain moments that come up for you to monetize that. So, you know, that for friends, friends, boyfriends, cousin wants to pick your brain about how to get a finance job. You can send them your link to talk to you for 30 minutes for a hundred dollars, right? Like you don't have to mentor people for free, or maybe your friend is starting a startup and they need some operations help and you're an operations expert, like charge them. Like we need to start setting boundaries because if you are not charging anything ever and just giving away all of your advice for free, like that's putting you in the negative. Like you have to pay for your tools. You have to pay your taxes. You have to pay for all of this. So anyways, First easiest way is just doing a paid scheduling link. You can do this on Calendly. You could, there's a ton of tools. Um, mm-hmm. Digital products is also another great way to start to monetize your LinkedIn. I guarantee you already have a digital product that you've created. You just don't know it yet. You have that budget template you made. You have that checklist that you sent to a friend. You have that presentation that you give You know, every time you're invited to speak. That, that all can become a digital product. And then lastly, consulting is a great, great way. Um, I think this, like, honestly, just a lot of the one-on-ones that you're going to be doing with your paid calendar link can turn into bigger consulting deals. So you're going to give them advice for 30 minutes. Again, maybe it's like your boyfriend's cousin's friend's startup. um, And you find out during that meeting that actually there is a need for this and you can go ahead and pitch them. So um, we have paid one-on-one calendar scheduling time. We have digital products and we have consulting. How do you, or do you have any advice for people who want to get into consulting? I'm asking this selfishly because that's something I've been wanting to do. And I'm like, how do I pivot 
to doing that? Like, do you message people that you offer that? Do you post about it that you offer that? Like, how do you get that first client? Yeah. Tapping into the network that you have right now is a great way to get that first client. But honestly, finding like micro groups is a really, really great way. So for example, every time I want a ghostwriting client, I just go to friends that um, work for like VC organizations and say like, hey, how are your founders right now? How are their personal brands? Do they need anything? And it becomes like a really strong referral practice. So maybe you make friends with a lawyer that helps small businesses. Um, can you tap into their network of clients of small businesses? Maybe you make friends with a CPA. Maybe you start to go to a co-working space that specifically works with small businesses. Like it's really just tapping into network networks. Um, and then making sure you're posting on LinkedIn so people are going to consistently be reminded of your expertise. Really, the goal is to create top of mind awareness. So let's say you are an operations consultant. You want to create top of mind awareness so people in your target audience on LinkedIn are seeing, okay, you are the go-to person for operations. It doesn't matter if they're ready to buy right now because when they are ready to buy, they're going to be struggling with operations problems. They're immediately going to think of you because they have the repetition of associating your name with operations and they're going to naturally reach out. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. It's a lot of positioning. Um, it's a lot of positioning. Okay, I want to wrap up. Two more questions for you. One being because you are, I would consider a very successful creator who has monetized and built like a very successful business. What are the different ways that you have monetized your personal brand? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I have a lot of reven revenue streams. So one is affiliate links. Um, okay. You can set this up at any uh, any size. Any size creator can set up affiliate links. I probably make like a few hundred dollars a month from affiliate links. Then I have digital products, um, which are pretty passive too. You create it once, you can sell it forever. Um, that's like a few thousand dollars a month. I also have um, cohorts. So these are live classes that I do uh, every other month-ish. So a little bit different than the um, than passive digital products. I also ghostwrite. Um, and, and consult for companies and for personal brands. I do brand sponsored posts. Mm -hmm. And oh, I actually have a new uh, monetization tool. Oh, I have my Patreon as well. I love Patreon. I actually started that because of Kevin Kelly's Thousand True Fans. If you've never heard of the concept, it's awesome. Basically, Kevin Kelly says, you don't have to have an audience of millions of followers to make a living. You just have to have a thousand true fans that you are that you can charge $10 a month and that's going to get you to six figures easy. And that's going to give you a comfortable living. I think that's like a really, really awesome immediate goal that really anyone can probably hit in like one or two years um, just by finding their thousand true fans. But a new monetization um, strategy that I, I've started to use and it's already making me, I think like $500 a month is um, guided co-working. So I'm already working. I decided to just charge people hundred dollars a month to come work with me every week um, where we post up on zoom i share a little tip or lesson we all share what we're going to be working on we go into deep work for like an hour and then we share our wins it's a really awesome fun way to monetize what i'm already doing and i think this is going to be a huge trend and i highly recommend other people start doing it especially if you can be specific with it. So mine is specifically content cr content creation. People are going to come work with me on content creation. Maybe you could do something like, well, audience, there's lots of tips, but maybe Michaela can do something like um, your Monday finance check-in, you know, and everyone's sharing how they're feeling about their finances, what they're excited about. Maybe you go through like, here's what I do to check in on my finances every, this is like my money church. And then at the end you celebrate your wins, right? So I think that's a great monetization route. I do that. I have an inner circle. What I've found, I've had two main challenges with it. One is from a programming standpoint, I always feel like I need to be offering more than just that check-in, right? Which I that might be a me thing. Um, but the other challenge is, well, there's actually a few. Getting people to show up because um, people will sign up and pay for something and then they'll never come, which is crazy to me. And then on top of that, it's, getting people to stay um, and like the consistent recurring payment of it. Um, I have found maybe it's because it's like budgeting, like it's people are just more aware of it. Um, 
but those have been my challenges with it. So mm. that how much are you charging? Ten dollars a month. Yeah, Maybe increase it, more. People, yeah. ten dollars a month is like whatever. I can forget. It's like a workout class. If you pay fifty dollars for a workout class, you're gonna get to that workout class. It does not matter how tired you are. If you pay like eight dollars for a workout class, you might miss it. So I think you just got to increase the price. But that's a great idea. And yeah, it does. If people pay and don't come, that's on them. <laughs> yeah, I love the idea of co working. I think that's such a great idea. Cause I find, I, I'm sure again, you experience this when you work for yourself and you're like alone and you have all this time. Um, it's hard sometimes to, I never get as much done as I want to, unless I have a meeting in the afternoon, a meeting in the morning blocks in my calendar that actually force me to get things done in a finite period of time. I have a meeting with one of my friends who also, um, works for herself every Wednesday for an hour and it's dedicated time for us to like accomplish something. Um, I love the idea of there being like a group for that. I think that's awesome. Um, yeah. Okay. It's also so great that, networking. Yeah. Uh, okay. We'll talk about that. I'm going to, I'd like to <laughs> we'll wrap up. Can you share how everyone a can find you and B how they can work with you? Because I went through your LinkedIn cohort. I thought it was awesome. I'm sure there are people listening to this who could benefit from that. And I think you also offer a TikTok social media one too. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, you can find me on Instagram at court Lynn Johnson and then on TikTok at Courtney period period Johnson. Um, you can find all my links there. My next cohort is starts at the end of October and that's going to be a LinkedIn cohort. It's going to be super fun and exciting. And yeah, I hope to see some of y'all there. Cool. I'll make sure all of her links are in the show notes and thank you so much for coming on. This was awesome. Amazing. Thank you.